Our speaker is Dr. Steve Lipner, who is currently working for MITRE Tech, which is a nonprofit organization which does contract work uh, for the government. Uh, in the past, he's had a long career of uh, ma maybe more years than some of you are old. Uh, no, I know that some of you are old, uh, at least one. Uh, and uh, in computer security, um, he has um, worked for MITRE. Uh, doing contract work uh, mainly for the Air Force. Um, he worked uh, for the um, TIS, where he was the keeper of the TIS gauntlet firewall uh, until he went to MITRE recently. Uh, before that, uh, he was at Digital Equipment Company, where they developed the A1 VSS. Uh, um, he is the designer of a key escrow system and uh, has many thoughts about the commercial viability of computer security and high assurance uh, given today's marketplace and what customers appear to be asking for. So without any more introduction, I'll let uh, Dr. Lipner uh, tell you his thoughts. Okay. Um, let, me just, let me just make a, a couple of, of, of observations before... Uh, before I got started with the slides, and, and the slides, you know, are sort of my guess at, at some some background and some things that you know I've I've observed over the last uh, uh, almost 30 years. Uh, I've been in the computer and information security business for a long time, though I though I qu I'm quick to add not as long as as Clark, and uh, and like. <laughs> And, and I also just, have, in the interest of, of truth and truth and advertising, I have to point out that I that I don't have a doctorate. Uh, I have a master's degree, and not only that, uh, the master's degree is in something irrelevant like civil engineering. Al although uh, al although I've sort of learned a little uh, a little about computer security and computer science on the fly, um, the success of my years in computer security may be fairly assessed, perhaps, by the fact that, that I've worked for uh, two profit-making companies, uh, TIS and Digital Equipment, neither of which any exists anymore, um, although I, I disclaim, <laughs> I disclaim uh, responsibility for, for their respective demise, and, and we, can, we can talk about why that was, if, if you like. Seriously, what I want to do is to try to just give you an overview of some chronology from my perspective. Um, Cynthia was pointing out to me when I was showing you these slides that the chronology doesn't have, have multics on it, but, but I, wasn't really, uh, I wasn't really as heavily involved with, with the multics development and, and, uh, and so on as, as I was with some of the other systems on the chronology. And it gives you a sense of sort of what's happened over the last uh, three decades. Um, I'm going to talk about, about secure systems and security kernels and some of the research that was done in the 70s. I'm going to talk in, about the Orange Book and trusted systems, and that's really sort of a background of the 80s. I'm going to talk about uh, building and selling uh, secure si trusted systems um, and, you know, wh where things did and didn't get to why, you know, sort of what happened with the Orange Book, what has been happening. Uh, beyond Trusted Systems goes a little into, uh, into some of the more commercially successful experiences with security and, and really talk about what people will buy. And, uh, you know, and, and that, that may not be something that, that those of us who are sort of in the national security and defense world might like to hear, but I think it's important that people understand what you know what what sells and why it's sold, and, and maybe you, maybe you already have that perspective. And then I'm going to look a little at the common criteria, which is the the government's current way of evaluating secure systems. Talk about assurance, multi-level security, and um, and and then try to give you a little little perspective on on what might be happening in the future. Um, Cynthia and I were talking in her office this morning, and she said that she had received over the weekend an email message, basically, I guess, sent to the entire Navy uh, that talked about what to do when, uh, when, when a, an email message from one of the classified networks 
spilled, I guess that's the euphemism of choice in the, in the communications world, and wound up on the internet. So if you, if you get a secret email message, here's what you're supposed to do about it if you're in the Navy. Um, and, you know, we've been, we've been, I don't know, we, Clark and I, have been trying for 30 or more years to build mechanisms that kept that from happening. And I guess, uh, I guess we've got to try harder or something because people have deployed this technology and it really works well except for some things like um, maybe, maybe like keeping secret messages from coming out on the internet. And most of the time it even does that. Uh, but, but you can speculate about malice and, and other things and, and when, when bad, thing ha bad things happen to good secrets. So here's Steve Lipner's perspective absolutely ir illegible. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, talk, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give, get hard copies of this to, uh, to Cynthia or something. I mean, this is, this is, I, I took, a, took an update course on, on giving presentations a few years ago, and, uh, and, and they told us things to do and not to do. This is something not to do, but, it, but, but I don't know any other way to, to sort of track these events this, this many events over this many years, sort of briefly. Uh, you've got the Defense Science Board panel and the Ware Report, which, uh, which Clark was involved with back in 65, 68. Uh, the Air Force Data Service Center in, in the late 60s said, you know, we need to process classified and -secret, top secret and secret data um, on, on one, one time sharing system. Can you help us? And the answer was yes, at least for a while. And then some things you know, like the Bell Lapagula model, uh, some prototypes. The Computer Security Center was formed at NSA in 1981. Um, we started research on an A1 system for, for, for the VAX computer line from DEC in the early 80s. I uh, actually got the system to field test in 88 or 89, I think, and then canceled it in 90. Um, the, uh, the explosion of the internet began in, in 94. Um, and then my ending bullet is that four firewall vendors had initial public offerings and made a batch of internet millionaires in the, in the mid 90s. So, so what's been going on? With, with computer security and what's worked and what hasn't worked, um, and how does that relate to people who are trying to, to, pro to protect uh, you know, sensitive and classified information for the, for the government? And um, I mean, it, you know, not all of it is real, is real optimistic, but let's sort of, sort of see what, what's been happening. Um, in 1967, the Ware Report came out initially as a confidential document. It was declassified in the late 70s, and you can get copies of it. And it basically said that, that, that computer security was a difficult problem. I guess we know that by now. And it also said that open multi-level systems, like connecting the internet to your secret network, was something that really should be avoided. Um, and, and so, you know, taking that as a challenge uh, and working at MITRE and for the Air Force, we started initial work on multi-level security because we still had these requirements. We had a requirement um, from the Military Airlift Command that said they wanted uh, to connect their unclassified and, and secret networks. We had the Air Force Data Service Center requirement for secret and top secret uh, multi-level. And these were all in sort of the time-sharing system paradigm you know, terminals and, and big computers that was, that was current during, during that day. Um, one of the things that happened in that era, and it's long gone so you can talk about it, or at least I'm willing to talk about it by name, was that McDonnell Douglas Automation Company had a, a time-sharing service bureau in St. Louis with big 360 computers, uh, and they wanted to use them a little bit of time for, uh, for classified work, or maybe a lot of the time for classified work, probably designing the F-15. And then the rest of the time, they wanted to sell time you know, to people like me who were civil engineers designing roads and other things on them, uh, you know, dialing in. 
And so they said, well, we fixed OS 360, which was the IBM operating system, um, and, uh, and now it's secure. Um, and so even though we have these unclassified users coming in, we'll let them, uh, you, you know, they can't get to our secret data. And so ARPA put a team together, or DARPA put a team together uh, of some folks to come in and, and try and just see how good a job they'd done. And, uh, and, and they broke in, and they got the test data. And so McDonnell Douglas took the capability down and said, well, we'll fix those holes. And they fixed the holes. And uh, they said, all right, ARPA, come back. You can't do it to us this time. And so they did it, uh, and, and, and they did it again. And there's some debate, and of course, none of this is documented. It's sort of uh, anecdotal war stories. Uh, there's some debate about how many cycles that went through, but eventually they gave up. Uh, and there were other tests along the way. Uh, Dials, the DIA online system, which was a, an intelligence processing system, that also was the subject of, of uh, penetration testing. And all the work basically involved, we'll take these time-sharing systems, we'll plug the holes, uh, we'll maybe give them some knowledge of classified information, classification and clearance, and we'll make them operational. And all the tests came along and said, if I can get a program in, you know, whether it's in BASIC or Fortran or assembly language or so on, um, I, can, I can do you in. I can defeat the controls, I can take over the system, I can get at all the data. And the conclusion we drew was that retrofits are hopeless on bug-prone monoliths. And I'll, I'll give you at least an informal definition of bug-prone monolith toward the end of this presentation. Uh, but, but you want to remember that point about retrofits and bug-prone monoliths. So the Air Force sponsored a panel that said, OK, there, there's a path to a solution to the multi-level security problem. And that path ought to involve mathematical models so that we know what we're trying to build uh, in a security sense, a reference monitor, which is an abstraction that, that mediates between users and, and pro or programs acting on their behalf, and data, and, uh, and, and, and does so in a way that's constrained by the mathematical model. Uh, and then security kernels, which are the implementations, and are small and simple and, and, and assured, uh, capable of being assured to be correct. Um, the Air Force followed up on that uh, on the Anderson panel uh, to start to fill in the details. They built the bell Lapagula model, which everybody's heard of, uh, and the bell Lapagula model was driven by, by the Trojan horse or untrusted software threat. Um, and I'm going to come back with a war story about untrusted software in a few slides, too. We actually built a security kernel for the PDP-1145, which was a DEC mini computer uh, with memory mapping, and, and demonstrated that it could do some pretty toy applications, but kind of interesting ones. We did a security enhanced version of the Multics time sharing system. Uh, and that was actually fielded and operational at the Air Force Data Service Center in the Pentagon probably from, say, 76 or 77 until the late 80s when it was replaced by a system whose security capabilities weren't as great. Um, and we started some efforts that were, were canceled, a more robust security kernel uh, for the PDP-11. Uh, and Project Guardian, which was to take Multics, minimize the, the operating system, structure it, and actually get to a high level of, high level of assurance with a system that would be, uh, be application-program compatible uh, with the Multics operating system. Effort was canceled, basically. I don't really have, have good perspective on everything. The sort of folklore was that there was a lot of politics, a lot of interorganizational dispute within the Air Force and, and the intelligence community, um, and, and maybe some questioning about whether, uh, whether, whether Multics was the right platform and whether the, the developments were feasible. But by the late 70s, 
we thought we understood how to do multi-level security. Uh, we thought we had the technology down uh, pretty pat. And, 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 and a, a, a colleague of, of Clark's and mine named Steve Walker moved to the office of the Secretary of Defense and started what was called the Computer in Security Initiative to convert that techno technological understanding into mainstream products. Um, and, and the Computer Security Initiative sponsored the national conferences that became the National Information System Security Conference. The trusted computing base terminology that, uh, you know, that you, you see in the orange book um, and the formalization of levels of features and assurance that would support evaluation of products uh, for their security properties. And that work culminated in the formation of the National Computer Security Center at NSA in, uh, in 1981. And the, National, the Computer Security Center, in turn, promulgated the, uh, the Trusted Compu Computer Systems Evaluation Criteria, the Orange Book, that evolved from the Computer Security Initiative. Um, when we started building the Orange Book, uh, or when, when NSA started building the Orange Book, the key questions were, were you know, okay, so you're going to evaluate systems and you're going to characterize their security by levels. Um, then the question is, how do you characterize them? What are the levels? What's in each? Um, the underlying assumption was that if you were going to do real, real multi-level security, like, say, connect your secret data up to the Internet, um, you, you need a pretty high level of, 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 of assurance pretty high level of security, something like a B3 or an A1 system. Um, the, the B2 systems, which basically have a, a big operating system but with some structure and certainly know about classification and security models, are okay for, for closed environments, but not if you're going to get the, let the scum of the earth really get access to your system. And then below that, Basically, you're talking about honest users and no malice at all. Um, the, the Orange Book also considered what, what I call market factors, motivating the vendors, motivating the users, and, and transition. Okay, this, this is not the sort of talk I'm used to where I stand here and talk. If you have questions, sing them out, okay? Be as disrespectful as you wish. It'll, uh, it'll be more entertaining. For your, uh, for your colleagues and maybe for me. Do they normally ask questions, Cynthia? Not the huh? <laughs> yeah, okay. No, I, uh, it, 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 helps, it helps me stay on track, and, and I'm trying to, you know, you know I, I mean, I'm glossing over a lot of stuff, but, but the intent is that you'll motivate me to go into whatever details uh, you want to hear. By uh, by asking by asking questions, I'll I'll finish I'll finish by one, no matter how many questions you ask. I promise. Okay. So so the, so the intent was to make was to make C two systems real easy to build, uh, get an immediate rating, and they were sort of based on some existing products for IBM mainframes called ACF two, RACF, and Top Secret. B one was intended basically to make it easy for, for vendors to introduce mandatory security, the Bella Padula model, into their products by ju basically just grafting security labels onto a C2 system and they'd be done. Users were supposed to get motivated by the fact that there was a range of products that they could buy. And, and because those were retrofit levels, they'd start to get into secure and evaluated systems with, with, with products that were compatible with the things they were now doing. Indeed, we believed that, that many users were already running ACF2 and RACF, and, and so you know, the C2 evaluation would sort, of, would sort of endorse some things they were already doing. And the transition, B1 was mandatory security training wheels. That's due to, to Ted Lee, who used to uh, 
work at, at Unis, UNIVAC, or, or UNISYS as I guess it's now called, uh, the notion that we'd take a not very assured system, bug prone monolith, we'd add mandatory security, and then users would get used to managing and using those controls. Application vendors would get used to building applications that ran under those controls. Um, the, the, the rating would be easy and immediate, um, and, and the model would, would extend, the application would extend when you started to build B2 and B3 systems um, with, uh, with, with real security. Uh, and, and users would be able to gracefully make the transition to multi-level. So in 84 and 85, there were a batch of initial evaluations granted based on the existing systems that were actually the models for, building, for, for developing the Orange Book. Uh, ACF2 and, and Top Secret got their C2s. The SCOMP, which is still around as the Wang XTS, um, got its A1 in 85, I think, maybe off by a year, 84, 86. Multix got its, its B2 maybe a year later, uh, 87. Um, and, and, and the other vendors were acutely concerned. I mean, I was at DAC, and we didn't have anything rating in the, rated in that first round. And that was a source of great concern to, to us. So we were, uh, we, we were putting a lot of energy into getting the C2 for our mainstream product, thinking about how to get to B1 with that mainstream product, and building an A1 system. And most vendors were, uh, were trying to develop most at, at B2 and above. And, and everybody was doing C2s. Uh, so that was the picture in, 19, uh, in 1985, 86, 87. Of course, when I say most vendors, I'm talking about a batch of companies that aren't in business anymore. Uh, talking about burrows, I'm talking about digital equipment, I'm talking about controlled data, I'm talking about Univac, not Unisys, um, IBM certainly. But, but, you know, I, I mean, I suspect I just, I just named some vendors that, that some of you have never heard of or certainly don't associate with building, uh, building computers in their own operating systems. Uh, it was a, it was a very, very different world. And what happened, one of the things that happened was that the process got more rich or formal or structured with the need for, for consistency as all these products came into evaluation. And because of that, we had what, what were called interpretations of the Orange Book that, that had the effect of adding more rigor and structure in the areas of documentation, features, and testing for the C2 systems. And in part because of that, and in part because maybe people underestimated the challenge, the duration and cost of the C2 and B1 process grew compared to what those of us who were involved in the initial development of the Orange Book had expected it to be. So VMS got its C2 initially in 1985, I think. But then the next version, which we thought was just an upgrade and, and, and adding mandatory security, took seven years. And so that was from VMS 4.3 to VMS version 6, uh, with a lot of, of intermediate releases along the way, and, and seven years. Sun asserts that their B1 compartment mode workstation, which has not yet been evaluated, I mean, it's still a candidate for, for B1, um, has cost them $50 billion. Uh, of, of development cost over, uh, over, I don't know, 1998, maybe 10 or 12 years. Um, you're, talking, you're talking real money, okay, for C2, B1. And what did I say about C2 and B1? Yeah, it's junk. Um, I, I probably... I mean, I probably, I probably, I probably would would rather rather this this lecture be more or less on on a non-attribution basis if I'm going to use words like junk, and I'd rather I'd rather use 
I'd rather use, use words like junk and at least keep myself honest. Um, so, you know, you, you've, got, you've got these kind of costs, and, and, and in, in part because of that, the B2s dropped, okay? We went from, from everybody doing B2 and above to basically nobody except Wang sticking with it. Wang and Data General, I guess, are the, the folks at this point who are doing, uh, doing real operating system, some real operating system B2s. Um, and, and the reasons were cost, um, market. Um, I remember during the days of my A1 system having a visit from, a, from an Air Force officer who was a, a, a good security guy, good friend, uh, longtime acquaintance who came, who came and listened to our briefing and said, Steve, nobody wants, a, nobody wants an A1 time-sharing system anymore. Uh, the market moved on to, you know, to PCs and workstations, client-server networking, and, and we were stuck uh, building A1 systems, B3 systems, back in the, uh, the time-sharing era. Uh, you could take another round, but the development cycles for that level of assurance were so outside the mainstream and so long that you know, by the time we had done an A1 for the, for the PCs and workstations um, as they existed in 90 or 92, um, you know, there'd have been another revolution, another cycle, and we'd be behind again. And, and that was the reason for those cancellations, uh, in, in my view. I mean, we talk, we used to talk at the time, it was, it, it was good market politics to blame the export restrictions on, uh, on highly trusted systems. And certainly, I'm as guilty of having done that as the next guy. But the fact of the matter is that we and others canceled, canceled our A1 systems and our B3 systems because we didn't think enough people would buy them. And, and if, we, uh, if, we, you know, if we shipped them, we'd sell some. But it was cheaper to, uh, to, to write off the development costs and cancel them than it was to ship a few and then be stuck supporting those customers for another 10 years. So that's, that's, that's the dynamics of the market. So what happened, you know, I mean, with, with seven years to C2 and no, and no systems evaluated higher, what really happened in the market, well, you know, you still have procurements, and the procurements still mandate evaluated systems, and so users make their own rules, their own interpretations, if you will. The MS 4.3 was, in fact, evaluated as a C2 system. Um, so the users said, well, that's good enough. We'll use 4.6, 4.7, uh, 5.0, 5.1, uh, based on that evaluation that was five, six, seven years ago. Um, it was evaluated on some specific hard piece of hardware, VAX 8600. That's probably also something that's before most of you were born. Uh, but, but we'll use other processors, and, and it's all about the same. Um, it was evaluated without a network, but nobody in his right mind can, can operate with a network. So, you know, it's a C2 system, and we'll, we'll operate it networked, and that will be okay. Um, the users do what the users do. Um, back, to, back to the email that, that Cynthia was talking about, um, and back to the, to the WHERE report. Um, remember we said that you know, to do real multi-level, unclassified up through secret, uh, you, know, you, want, you want B3. You want some, some assurance in there. Um, when I was with Trusted Information Systems, we had a, a government consulting, uh, you know, contract, contract operation, um, and somebody came to us with a, a network, uh, a computer network, and they wanted us to do a, a penetration test as part of an evaluation for operation. And, and this system 
This network had, had the SIPR net secret up here at the top of the diagram. And it had the internet down here at the bottom of the diagram. And in between, you had this, this, this mess of stuff is the best way I can describe it. You know, there was a network network, and there was a CMW, and there were some Unix systems, and there were some P PCs. I don't think there were any NT systems at that time. It was a little too early for that. But there was Novell, and there was Sun, and there were other, maybe digital and other things. But the highest assurance component in that was probably the, the, the CMW, which was probably an unevaluated like to be B1. And, and so, you know, you have secret here, you have unclassified here. You've got a lot of stuff in between, and that's protecting the secret data. And, and that's the way people are operating today to get their jobs done. Maybe a little scary. Meanwhile, what happened, what happened you know, out in the, in the rest of the marketplace um, is that you can buy much, much more security stuff than, uh, than, you, could, than you could 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, firewalls, you know, people, you know, people making fortunes on firewalls. Security configuration managers and intrusion detection systems, um, encryption and tunneling products. I'll tell you some funny stories about tunneling products if you get me started. Although I don't have I don't have slides sl slides about them. Um, the authentication token gadgets, virus scanning, and that's all because of the internet. I mean, uh, six or eight years ago was sort of the low point. For, uh, for security products and, and, and security people. And then the internet got people connecting their, uh, their internal networks and systems to, to that great world out there. And, and, you know, and I guess a few things happened. And, and you know, certainly, I mean, you know, there, were, there were Mitnick, there was Morris, there were other, other things that got publicity. And, and certainly people became aware of that. And as a result, um, they wanted security. And vendors were there to provide it to them with all this stuff, uh, firewalls and virus scanners and what have you. And so they bought. C2-like security is, in fact, in most of the operating systems, uh, server operating systems, multi-user operating systems that people buy. You know, they have authentication. Um, they have access control. They have auditing. Uh, they may or may not have the, 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 the evaluation. They probably don't in most cases. But they meet the intent. And users, some of them look for some C2 rating somewhere. And they sort of more or less understand the threats to their systems uh, from the internet and from authorized users. And they do the best they can. They actually seek third party evaluation. but. Because, you know, at this point, the, the government, the Orange Book style evaluations, don't apply to a lot of the things they buy. They look at things like NCSA, the National Computer Security Association, and the trade press. To, uh, to, to, and that, that passes for an evaluation. And users sort of build what they can. You know, they cobble together firewalls and uh, tokens and, and virus scanning and, and Java blocking uh, for, uh, for usual network configurations. And then they secure themselves, and they more or less operate. Uh, and they build more interesting configurations, sharing information, uh, sharing information outside the, the confines of their enterprises. And they, and they do the best they can. I don't think any of this is particularly it's not unuseful. It's not adequate for classified information. Um, so high, of, high assurance systems today are B1. I told you the story about this, uh, this network that we were asked to evaluate uh, for a government customer. Uh, they, never, they never let the contract with us. I think, they were, I think we licked our chops too much at the prospect of doing a penetration test on that network. And they, and they re re review, re withdrew the request that we look at it. But, uh, but they do the best they can, um, and high assurance is B1, so that's what they use.
Now, the common criteria and the evaluation process that are, that are evolving, yeah? Can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. I'm not going backwards. So you're saying in the area P what what I see what I see is people using is people using B1 systems and CMWs in configuration in configurations where 15 years ago we would have told them to use a B3 or an air gap okay but an air gap is not operationally acceptable and a B3 system for the most part, is unavailable. So, you know, they use, they, they plug things together, and, and away they go. So you're talking about military and government yep. systems? Military and government systems. Yeah. Have you been approached by any of the electronic commerce people like, you know, eBay or Amazon.com or the banking uh, brokers or any of those guys that, that now are pounding secured socket layer encryption, the 128 bit, like that's the answer, and once you have that, no problem about your credit card. No problem about your stock account. Is that is that a facade, or is that really cool? And, and that's it's, not a. I mean, those are. Well, well, I mean, okay, Miter Tech works mostly for government, so so they don't. Uh, I mean, they did come to us, uh, you know, when I was in the commercial world at, at TIS, and 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 they used and they used our products. Um, secure socket layer. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a cryptographer, although, although, I mean, you know, but, but I believe it's probably fine cryptography. Uh, the question is, is exactly what are they doing with, uh, you know, exactly what are they doing with the web servers behind, uh, you know, that, that, are, that are terminating that secure sockets layer, okay, um, and and in some cases, I suspect that you know between restricting access through firewalls, and um, and 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 restricting the application set of software that runs on those systems, and um, and and, uh, and and configuration management and and so on. They're probably in pretty good shape, but 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 you know I mean I think you can make the case that 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 you know the credit card numbers on those systems are not necessarily as sensitive as some of the information that the government needs to protect. That's one that's one comment I would make, and the other is that the applications, uh, you know, while they're very high transaction rates, they're not as rich as 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 some of the things. I mean, you know, the government, y you can argue that, um, oh, that surfing the web from behind a, cla from a, from a classified environment or, uh, or, even, or even SMTP email is more exposed or more exposing in some ways than, uh, than, uh, um, than just doing SSL to a web server. Um, I, I told you I'd talk about encryption. I, I want to, let me, let me finish, but, but I have a VPN story that I'll tell you if I, if I get finished, uh, if I get finished before one o'clock. Um, so, so, so what we do today, you know, the, the common criteria is really derived from the, from the European IT SEC uh, evaluation criteria. And that basically says the user or the vendor specifies what he wants built and then, and then specifies one of a predefined set of assurance classes uh, to which the system will be built, and, uh, and, and the system will be built that way. Now, this has some, some downsides that we considered during the Orange Book debates, because, for example, you know, if I've got a firewall with feature set ABC, and you've got a firewall with feature set ADF, uh, and we each get them evaluated, how does the user decide which one is right? Uh, that's probably less important for some of these specialized products, probably more important for operating systems. Um, you know, and, and, and we also worried during the evolution of the Orange Book that procurement specs would be loaded for some vendor, you know, in this kind of a model, that procurement specs would be loaded for some vendor who wasn't us. Um, 
the variety of products in the Orange Book days was less. There were operating systems or operating systems. And so today, I think probably the cri common criteria is a reasonable and practical approach. Certainly increases the, uh, the evaluation bandwidth. Uh, you have commercial labs doing the evaluations um, and, and the government monitors. And that's a quicker process than having everything thin-threaded through a set of government, government and government, uh, government hired contractors who are doing all the evaluations. If there are more products to evaluate, the labs will hire more people and more evaluations will get done. And that's important because in the internet world, um, you know, the, the, the criteria are fast, fast, and fast. Uh, you've got to do things timely or it just doesn't matter. Uh, building, building systems with seven-year evaluation cycles uh, won't cut it. Uh, the U.S. NIAP, the National Information Assurance Partnership, which is the U.S. implementation, and the common criteria do let you evaluate new kinds of products, do let you evaluate current versions, do you let you evaluate at a reasonable cost. We took the Gauntlet Firewall 3.2 version um, through a European ITSEC evaluation. And in fact, it got evaluated um, E3 to our protection profile before the next version had shipped. Um, not something that happens normally with, with, with the old C2 way. Um, the other comment about rapid evaluation is, you know, don't get carried away. Okay, these systems are junk anyway if there are 15 million lines of code down there. So, uh, you know, don't kid yourself that you're getting every bug out. You want a reasonable level of consistency, re reasonable level of documentation. Um, but, you know, I mean, you're not going to get every flaw out of, every, of 15 million lines. But you mean the operating systems, right? Well, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of code. The, the operating systems, you know, are sort of the foundation, and they're big. Um, I mean, I'll talk about big in a minute. Um, and as I said, the early indications are positive. You know, the European firewall evaluations, uh, actually U.S. commercial labs are doing evaluations under the NSA program called TTAP, um, and those are going out qu pretty quick. So I think, I, think this is, I think this is probably good stuff. Um, Comparability and competition still needs to be resolved, uh, you know, loading of procurement specs and the like. And, and the question that nobody's really answered and that, you know, sort of the mainstream marketplace really doesn't seem to care about is with or high assurance. And the answer is that commercial users really don't need multi-level security, okay? There's sometimes a notion of data classification, you know, TIS sensitive, digital confidential. There's almost never a notion of clearance. Those, those, those classification labels are just used to advise need to know. Government multi-level security demand is not as big a deal to the vendors as it was 20 years ago. Um, a, because defense is a less important fraction of the marketplace that vendors see than was the case 20 years ago. And, and B, because the defense users are giving up and say, the heck with it, just give me what I can buy and I'll make do. Meanwhile, downloadable code, Java, ActiveX, et cetera, et cetera, manifest the threat that Bell and LaPagula were worried about in 1973, okay? I mean, it's real. And there's still no mandatory security. Um, I don't know whether there will be. It's not, not necessarily an encouraging picture. Here's my perspective on assurance. Okay, I talked about Lee Schiller's kernel for the, for the PDP-11, and that was about 2,000 lines of a hideous programming language. The VAX A1 kernel was about 60,000. The TMOC kernel that was built at TIS and the Guardian kernel that was hypothesized for Multics but never built were about a quarter million. And then a couple of data points, VAX VMS version 5 was about 8 million lines. 
and uh, in the operating system, and Windows NT, you know, you hear various numbers, but all of them have lots of zeros. <laughs> so assurance is tough if you want a full function operating system. I mean, this isn't, this isn't because these are bad people. I know some of the folks in the NT group, they're smart guys, they're motivated, they're trying to build the systems that the customers want, and uh, if you don't believe they're building the systems that the customers want, look at, you know, look at the path of Microsoft stock. It's hard to say they're doing the wrong thing. Just that high assurance isn't high on their list, and you need Windows, and you need uh, inter-process communication mechanisms, and you need networking, you need all these other things, and those add code, and partitioning the system up so that there's a small TCB in the middle that you can assure costs time and money and performance that their users haven't told them they're willing to pay. You, somebody had a question up here. You, I yeah. I noticed you went from 60,000 to 8 million lines of code for you guys with back version 5. Is that because you introduced symmetric multi-processing? No, no. The, the SVS was an A1 system. VMS version 5 was a C2, OK? Uh, so this was, this was our, our approach and, and their papers. I don't know, have, have people read the pro papers? Have you assigned them, Cynthia? Uh, Maybe OK, I mean, there are, there are papers, I, I can give you the reference if Cynthia can, um, about how we designed SVS um, to, to run, basically it was a virtual machine monitor. It mimicked the, the, the interface to the operating system, mimicked the uh, interface to the hardware. And what that let us do was to run any Unix or VMS system designed for a VAX on, on the security kernel, OK? And when you got a new release, when we went, actually we did that, when we went from 5 to 5.1 of VMS, you just take the upgrade tape, blast it onto the virtual machine, and now you had a, a VMS 5.1 system running on, running, on the, uh, running on the A1 environment. It had some limitations, performance, uh, hardware hacks that we had to do, um, and you know, just the usual feature stuff, I mean, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't get to workstations, you couldn't get to networking without going into the kernel. So, so, you know, so development got expensive as you wanted to add features, even though most of the trust, most of the features were outside of the trusted, trusted code. Um, and, and, and the limitations in performance and functionality just killed that system. But it, it was an interesting approach. That, uh, that's a, that's sort of a, a a side note, but, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a paper. I mean, the papers on that system are worth looking at. Um, covert channels are, are still a hard problem. Um, we, as we tried to build the A1 SVS, you know, the same system I was just talking about, we discovered that modulating things like disk use and processor use and stuff and stuff allowed you to send messages. OK, uh, covert channels in violation of the policy. And we cleverly built a, uh, a, a, you know, a fairly brilliant set of mechanisms that went by the name of Fuzzy Time to defeat those covert channels. And those were published in the IEEE Oakland Conference Proceedings 1991. And then a guy at NRL developed a, a, a model that defeated the fuzzy time mechanism and allowed a covert channel to, si to signal anyway and published that in the Oakland Conference 1992. Um, I'm not sure how much you can do about, about covert channels. The other thing is that users and applications still need to send information you know, across the classification boundary. Email, ops, intel interfaces, um, and so then you have uh, the steganography problem of hiding information in, in the flow back from high to low. And I think that's an area where we really could use a theoretical breakthrough if anyone ha has one lying around. Okay. So there are lots of research topics left. Covert channels and confinement I just talked about. Um, one of the questions that I pose is that the gauntlet firewall application itself, for example, other, other applications, 
SSL, what have you, are probably relatively small and they're designed for security, even though they're running on one of these bug-prone monoliths. Uh, so the question is, you know, is there anything that you can say in the, an in the presence of this miserable, uh, untrusted operating system? If it's not hostile, is there anything meaningful you can say? And we've been waving our hands at that for, for 25 or 30 years. And I don't know that there's a conclusive answer, but as difficult as it is to get A1-like A1 operating systems, maybe that's something people had better look at and make some strong statements about. There are high assurance components. Wang is still selling the XTS uh, 300. I guess that's the, the remaining A1 system. Uh, what's the most powerful way to use those? What's the, what, cryptography gives you a lot of leverage in terms of being assured that information won't be disclosed or modified. What are the best things you can do to integrate cryptography into highly assured systems and make maximum, take maximum advantage of this? I mean, I can, I can pass encrypted data to my six million lines of untrusted code and I can still be sure it won't disclose the data by breaking the cryptography. It won't modify the data without be, being detected by breaking the cryptography. It may do other th bad things to me, but, uh, but that's, a, that's a strong mechanism to, uh, to build on. And, maybe, and, and th those, are, those are research directions that I think ought to be explored. So what now? I'm out of time. Fortunately, I'm out of slides. Um, no silver bullets. I owe, I owe that to Fred Brooks, of course. Uh, you know, lots of opportunities for, for research. Meanwhile, defense systems are going to continue to use COTS components. Um, and users ought to understand what it means when they've got the SIPRNET here, the uh, internet here, and a CMW as the strong point in the middle. Sometimes the answer, and I, I have a uh, consulting role for some government customers, sometimes the answer is just say no. Um, I mean, you can't do that. And sometimes they don't want to hear that, and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they listen. I mean, I think, I think the, smart ones, the smart ones listen, because in, in today's world, there's some things that you can do that you just shouldn't. So I don't know that that's a... Uh, I don't know that that's an especially optimistic perspective on where we've gotten to in the last 30 years. I think it's, it's a realistic one. Certainly, if you're interested in doing research or, or advancing the technology and security, uh, the need for people to do that isn't going to go away anytime soon. I'll take questions until you get fed up and leave. Tell us about the VPN. Tell us about the VPN. Yeah, well. You can buy, it's a straight man in every crowd. Uh, you can buy these products called uh, encrypting tunneling clients, okay? Um, there are a variety of them. Uh, the uh, Checkpoint Firewall one, Secure Remote is one, Alta Vista Tunnel is another. There are others. And what they do is to sit on your PC and then you communicate over the internet um, from, your, from your PC to your home system, and they provide encryption of the, of the traffic um, between, between, between the PT, PC and your home. So people use that, and they configure it to give you access to your inside protected network with your corporate sensitive data on it, OK? But your PC is still on the internet, OK? So if I can get a Trojan horse onto your PC, then I can go back through the encrypted tunnel into your inside network, and uh, I can suck down anything you have access to off your, uh, off your, uh, off your inside network. Now, I, I mean, this is, this is a wonderful example of synergy. Uh, we hypothesized this attack, and we further hypothesized that the, that the best mechanism to exploit that vulnerability would be basically an interpreter that would sit on your PC, and I'd shoot it commands, um, and then it would probe your inside network 
you know, from your PC at my command. And so rather than have to, to do a tailored attack, I just do this, this general purpose thing and it would do anything I wanted it to on sort of an interactive basis. Well, there's something called back office, if you've heard of it on the hacker bulletin board. And it's just tailor made for, for installing on the PC of somebody who's using a, uh, one of these client tunneling VPNs uh, to, uh, to access an inside network. And I don't know whether, whether that was the motivation or it was just general nastiness. But the things out there, and it, it, you know, it's, it, you know, I mean, you see that in the, on, the, on the internet bulletin boards, you say, gee, I love it when a plan comes together. Um, and, but, but the important thing is that there are users, commercial users, commercial users who should know better, who are deploying these client VPN tunnels to, to access their inside networks and, uh, and, and, and thinking they're operating securely uh, over the internet. More questions? Okay. People have to go to class. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>